Welcome to GameSpot TV, your ultimate guide, computer and video gaming. I'm Adam Sessler. And I'm Lauren Fielder. Now, you may remember playing games in the arcade mm -hmm. like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Berserk, Tron, mm -hmm. but then again, you may not. Well, if you've missed them, don't cry because they're coming back and they're doing it in 3D. So we're putting our spotlight on the latest versions of some of the arcade's greatest classics. If she blinded me with science actually means something to you, or if the name Hammer connotes more than just a carpentry tool, then my friend, you are one of the fortunate survivors of the 80s. But eclectic music is just one of the decade's trademarks. The early 80s is also known as the golden age of arcades. Games like Asteroids, Donkey Kong, and Centipede lined the halls of arcade parlors. It was the time when getting the number one score meant more than passing the final exam. Now hold on to your parachute pants. Many of these timeless classics are being resurrected in 3D. Computer Gaming World's Johnny Wilson says the reason is pretty simple. Well, 3D enables you to uh, break out of the canvas of the computer screen, if you will. And, uh, of course, uh, the most obvious thing to do in marketing is to grab something familiar. And you grab something familiar and you give it a new twist. And way before we were babbling about MIP mapping, Z buffering, and twisting 3D, there was Asteroids. Released by Atari in 1979, Asteroids was one of the first arcade games that was designed using vector graphics the earliest form of polygon graphics. In 1998, Asteroids embraced the third dimension with this Activision remake. Yet even with the new snazzy look, developer Cyrox kept the game close to the original concept. Of course, this modern translation has all the 90s amenities, including power-ups and enough weapons to instill fear in giant flying rocks. The Game Masters at Atari were on a roll when they launched the arcade tank simulation Battlezone in 1980. Battlezone's graphics and concept caught everyone's attention, including the U.S. military, who commissioned an enhanced military version of the game. As the first three-dimensional first-person game, Battlezone provided a clear window into the future of gaming. And the future never looked so good when 1998's version of Battlezone hit the PC market. As the 80s rehash trend was getting ridiculous, this modern battle zone provided a deep sigh of relief. Besides the name, the new battle zone has little in common with its classic counterpart. Developer Pandemic Studios combined action and strategy elements in this new version, a deviation that was welcomed by the PC gaming community. I'm very, very proud of the way that we pushed Battlezone forward. Now, the original was a revolutionary game, then the game that we created is also considered revolutionary. Other classics that have made the leap into 3D include the green yet courageous Frogger and the trackball frenzied mushroom blasting game of Centipede from Hasbro. But the nostalgic pull of the classics have not ensured success for these modern versions. Ironically, the gameplay that made the classics memorable are considered too simplistic for today's core gamers. The reviews have been mixed. They get lousy reviews because, uh, you know, those of us who are cynics, you know, have uh, kind of uh, what I call Patch Adams syndrome. Is that basically, no matter how many people love it, you know, we're going to hate it because, you know, technically it's not as strong as we'd like to see. Good reviews or not, this yellow game icon and its mesmerizing chomping sound will stop people in their tracks. Pac-Man and his ghost buddies will be sporting a new look this September in celebration of its 20th anniversary. But don't think the 3D facelifts stop here. Namco and Hasbro are actively remaking other arcade classics. And no matter what they look like or how they play, this revival will force some players to reminisce about the days when they were getting blinded with science and dropping their weekly allowances into the bottomless arcade pits. She blinded me with science. I don't know if you can believe this, but they're even considering redoing Sinstar. So what's next, Pong? Actually, you're exactly right. Hasbro is updating Pong, and this time it's going to have penguins. Wow, and a $40 price tag? Uh, $39.95, I think. All right. But until then, here's the game news. In this week's game news, VideoGames.com has learned from Sega that the company will be working to develop and publish titles for handheld game consoles, including Nintendo's Game Boy Color. Sega says the decision to develop for competitors' platforms is due to the need for increased profits, as well as the fact that they have no plans for a handheld system in the next couple of years. 
Sega says they will not be developing for either the PlayStation or the N64. The recent death of professional wrestler Owen Hart has not prompted a claim to remove his character from the upcoming WWF Attitude. There will be some changes to the game, such as the removal of the option to select the specific outfit that Hart was wearing when he died. A claim will also dedicate the game in memory of the wrestler. In international news, New Zealand's current entertainment ratings legislation, which requires testers to review all of the content of video and computer games, is being revised to allow for ratings based on general impressions. The change comes after many testers complained about not being able to conquer the more difficult levels in some games. If you're looking for more gaming news, go to the GameSpot.com and the VideoGames.com websites. And if you want to stay nostalgic a little longer, watch a real video clip of our classic arcade games going 3D, and you can find it on our website at ZDTV.com slash GameSpotTV. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we go eighth in our preview of Donkey Kong 64, and we battle it out in our review of Magic and Mayhem. And you don't want to miss our review of Star Wars Episode One Racer when GameSpot TV returns. Welcome back. Now, you know me well enough. When it comes to console games, my true love is for the 3D platformer, and I haven't felt the same ever since I finished Banjo-Kazooie. Well, you know, Rare has another one coming out. So for all of you platform fanatics in the same boat as Adam, stick around, check out our next preview. It's for Donkey Kong 64. If completing Banjo-Kazooie left behind a yearning for another high-quality platform game, then rest assured, one is coming in the form of Donkey Kong 64 from Rare and Nintendo. Billed as being bigger than Zelda, the game will require the ramp pack, which will be bundled with the game. With a number of characters, textures, and real-time lighting effects, gamers can expect to be wowed. The game levels look graphically superior to Banjo-Kazooie and will appear to be the same size or even bigger. The character animations in the game are also of an incredible quality. While it seems similar to Banjo-Kazooie, Nintendo says that it will be less about puzzle solving than trying to get from point A to B. The game will offer five characters and each will come with their own moves. Donkey Kong 64 was a favorite with people at E3 and will most likely be a hot seller when it's released at the end of the year. Now, I've heard all the comments, but I don't think this game is that much like Banjo-Kazooie. Well, I've played a bit of it, and I can say I think it stands on its own, even at this early stage. But, of course, we'll have to wait for a review to find out. Yes, well, this next game, it's a real-time strategy game developed in the spirit of Myth the Fallen Lord. Though they've taken the very big step of focusing more on spells and fantastical creatures rather than dwarf and mortars and archers. So, check out Magic and Mayhem on the Grill. Mythos, the makers of the turn-based sci-fi hit XCOM UFO Defense, brings us Magic and Mayhem, a real-time strategy game with a fantasy theme. The player controls Cornelius, a young man who's been apprenticed to his uncle Lucan. Arriving at Lucan's home to begin the apprenticeship, you find him missing, and this sets you off on an adventure traveling through various realms searching for Lucan and trying to stop the greater evils that possess the land. Each mission is roughly the same. Your goal is to kill an opposing wizard using spells and summon creatures. While the spell system is interesting, the missions eventually descend into a click fest. You summon some monsters, you throw them at the bad guy, they die, then you start over at the next level. Talismans are the focus of Magic and Mayhem's spell system. On some levels, Cornelius will find spell ingredients. Each ingredient can create up to three different spells depending on which talisman it's put into. Besides a spell system, the other element that stands out is the music. It's quite enjoyable and adds to the overall feeling of the game. With more control over your allies, more interesting combat, or just a bit more depth, Magic and Mayhem would have been a better game. Overall, the missions are just too repetitive, and the mechanics are just too unrefined for it to be anything more than a short diversion. Ron Doolin of GameSpot.com gave Magic and Mayhem a rating of 6.3 out of 10. It's too bad they didn't have a Dark Elf Necromancer. Well, anyway, you guys have probably been a wee bit tired of us yammering on and on about all the games affiliated with the new Star Wars movie. So we finally have something real to show. We have a review of the first title to be released, and that's Star Wars Episode I Racer on the Grill. 
biggest scene from the biggest film seems like a difficult act to follow, but episode one racer from LucasArts for the N64 would appear to meet the challenge. The scene is an obvious choice for a game translation. Ben Hur-esque chariot races using pod racers, a cockpit dragged forward by huge starship engines. These vehicles reach speeds upwards of 600 miles per hour and fly little more than a few feet off the ground. Unlike the movie, the game offers more courses than just tattooing. There are seven additional planets and over 20 pilots to choose from. The gameplay is similar to other futuristic racers, such as Wipeout Excel and F-Zero X, except that there are no power-ups and no offensive weapons until you unlock the main boss. You compete in tournaments made up of four or more races, where if you place fourth or better, it's a new lap record. you can move on and earn money to upgrade your pod racer. I got everything you need, huh? The main element of the game is speed, and at 60 frames per second, you'll come up on obstacles so quickly, you might not know how you avoided them. Despite its difficulty, the speed of the game is controlled by a great physics engine and sublimely elegant controls. The graphics in the game are excellent, even without a RAM pack. In fact, they're so nice that you may wipe out because you're admiring the scenery. There are instances of pop-up that may not cause you to crash, but will keep you from seeing as far as you want to. The game does suffer from music that can best be described as incidental, though the sound effects are quite good. Also of note is that the game starts off easy and then suddenly becomes very challenging and would have benefited from more tracks to help stretch the game out. Even with these complaints, Episode 1 Racer is a great game and is superior to any futuristic racing game on the N64. In fact, it may be superior to the scene in the movie that inspired it. Joe Fielder from VideoGames.com gives it an 8.4 out of 10. Well, if that game appealed to you, then stay tuned for our strategy guide later on in the show. And if you're looking for more video game reviews, you'll find the latest titles, including Star Wars Episode One Racer, at the VideoGames.com website. And if you have questions about anything on the show, make sure you send us your feedback via email at GameSpotTV at ZDTV.com. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we have a brag fest ahead with a preview of Quake 3 Arena for the PC. And we have more racing action ahead with a review of Ridge Racer 4 when GameSpot TV returns. Welcome back. Now, while a lot of people have been asking me about Gran Turismo 2, there's still many people out there that like nothing more than an arcade-style racer. And you're going to have to wait for GT2, so you might as well sit back and watch our review of Ridge Racer Type 4. No matter what one thinks of other racing games, Ridge Racer has always been the preferred series when it comes to arcade-style driving. And the fourth installment in the series will continue to appeal to fans as it makes improvements while maintaining its same basic feel. The main mode of the game is Grand Prix, where you pick one of four teams and one of four car manufacturers and then race on eight tracks. The requirements for continuing through the game change as you play, with you only having to place third or better in the first two races to having to place first in the last four. You will be given three attempts on each track before having to race the entire heat all over again. As you complete each heat, you'll be given a newer, faster car whose quality will depend upon your performance in the races. These cars can be used in the two-player versus mode or the time trial mode. The game includes two types of cars, the grip and the drift. Drift cars are faster and meant for power sliding. And grip cars keep better traction to let you compete if you haven't mastered the art of the slide. Graphics in the games are simply great. It moves at a high, smooth frame rate, and tracks are filled with detail, even if some flaws are apparent. The soundtrack is a bit more mellow than in past games, but it still fits in nicely. In the end, if you've cared for any of the games in the Ridge Racer series, then the fourth one is definitely for you. Jeff Gertzman from VideoGames.com gives it an 8.7 out of 10. Now, you can get Ridge Racer Type 4 with the JogCon controller where you control a wheel similar to the shuttle on your VCR. But what do you have there, Lauren? This is a NEDGECON. Came out first, and it's like a steering wheel. Mm -hmm. Harder to find, but I think more fun. But now we go from some racing action to some running action, because you do a lot of that in this next game. As I've learned, because I spent all my time at work playing the beta of Quake 3 Arena. 
While there never seems to be a lack of first-person shooters, one game that unsurprisingly looks to stand out from the pack is id Software's multiplayer-focused shooter, Quake 3 Arena. Why? First of all, the game looks gorgeous. Colors and textures leap off the screen as players hurtle through the game's deathmatch arenas at breakneck speed. By concentrating on the multiplayer game, id Software is hoping to perfect the competitive quality that so many gamers responded to. No internet connection? Fear not. Players will be able to activate intelligent bots and engage in a solo frag fest. Apart from new graphic effects, such as organic textures, fog and lighting effects, the game still retains the same visceral gameplay that made its predecessors so good. One of the gaming community's most respected players, Dennis Thresh Fong, explains. Uh, I think it has a lot of the same graphics as Quake 2, the, the beauty of it, and also uh, the gameplay of Quake 1. Uh, a lot of people, you know, the community is generally pretty split about these things, and I think Quake 3 is really going to bring bring together the whole action category and bring everybody together into one. We'll see if this unity can succeed on Quake 3 Arena's September release. So I hear you're moving from being a camper to quite a strafer. Yes, word is out, but even despite my prowess, evil does pop up in all kinds of games. Well, demons and fallen angels are pretty tough to get rid of. So here are some cheats for Requiem Avenging Angel. To activate the Requiem Avenging Angel cheat codes, press enter and type in one of the following cheats. Keep running out of ammo, type in CS ammo, and you will have enough mundane firepower to last you to hell and back. It's tough being an Avenging Angel. Type in CS Shroud, and you'll get full armor and full health. Tired of being a pawn of the Almighty? Typing in CSYWH will help Malachi save humanity in God mode. If you're looking for cheat codes, you can find them on the GameSpot TV website in the Game Help section. And check out the GameSpot TV message boards where you can put up tips for other gamers or challenge someone to a good old-fashioned frag fest. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we have the latest hardware pick from Computer Gaming World's Dave Salvatore. And if you're having trouble with your pod racer, don't worry. We have a strategy guide to help you. This and more when GameSpot TV returns. Welcome back. PC joysticks are mostly designed for right-handers. I guess the companies assume the left-handed people don't play games. I don't know about that, but we did find a company that's found a way to appease both sides, and Dave Salvatore has the game gear. If you've been getting into flight sims, you may be ready to go out there and get your first joystick. I've got one here called the Jet Leader USB from our friends at Gimo International. This is a USB stick that in some ways isn't so interesting, except for one thing. Ambidextrous. If you're a left-handed gamer, this joystick is your friend. Most joysticks are engineered for right-handed gamers, but Gimo went ahead and engineered this one to be ambidextrous. So left-handed, right-handed, you can game with this guy. It has the usual trappings of a joystick. You got your two buttons up here, view hat, two front-mounted buttons, and then an additional four down here at the bottom. But the only thing we didn't like about this guy was that its throttle slider, which is down here, never completely zeroed out, which means that when you go to idle your plane or your vehicle, the engine throttle will still be at about 10%. Long story short, this is a pretty solid stick, especially for your first stick. And if you're a left-handed gamer, you might want to check this guy out. Heavy Metal Fact 2 comes from Kevin Eastman of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fame. And now this post-apocalyptic action game is set to be released this fall, so here's a sneak peek.
Jason, this game continues the narrative of the heavy metal two film that's currently in development. And on the topic of movies and films, it's Star Wars Episode One Racer. Here are those strategy tips from expert gamer. Don't let Anakin Skywalker fool you. Piloting a fireball at 800 miles an hour is not easy. Episode One Racer for the N64 gives players a taste of the nasty sport of pod racing. Non-Jedis need not apply. One way to win is to get an instant boost at the starting line. To do this, hold down the accelerator when the last set of countdown characters fade. Let's try that again. Timing is critical here, so watch the last character carefully. If executed correctly, the pilot yells out and other racers are left eating Tatooine dust. Of course, speed is a big part of the game, but it's only secondary to control. Knowing how to hold the N64 joystick can mean the difference between crossing the finish or being desert bait. To attain high speeds on straightaways, press up on the joystick to put the racer's nose down. To get a better handle on turns, press down on the joystick to lift the racer's nose up. Tight turns, treacherous tracks, and rabid racers guarantee damages. Players must repair damages as soon as possible if they plan on reaching the finish line alive. To repair the pod, hold down the right shoulder button of the controller until the repair has been made. Take note though, while repairing, the pod will slow down. It will take more than a Jedi mind trick to win races in this game. Use all the tricks you can and practice. Try to use the instant boost. Hold your nose right and repair the pod as quickly as possible. Last but not least, try not to hit the walls. Well, for the first of the Episode 1 games, not bad, but we'll have to wait and see about the other ones. Yes, and you know we'll be covering those in the upcoming weeks, and that will include Star Wars The Phantom Menace. That's it for now, but you can always check us out on the web at ZDTV.com slash GameSpot TV. And don't forget to join us for our chat sessions next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Until next week, bye. Bye-bye.